Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. I'm not sure, but I think our car has a mind of its own. When my husband and I are driving and pass a new garden center or plant place, that car just hits the brakes and pulls into their parking lot. Well, it's not quite like magic, but it sure leads to finding some very unique and unusual plants and places. I'm Mary Holm, and come along with Prairie Yard and Garden as we visit one of those very unique places called Grass Roots near Otter Tail, Minnesota. the following things have in common. Flowers, herbs, trees, beautiful containers of plants, a giant dragonfly, tomatoes, melons, and recycled turf from St. John's University. Come along and we'll get the answers when we visit with Tom Meinover of Grassroots Garden Center. Welcome Tom. And welcome Mary Holm to Grassroots. Tell us about your background and how Grassroots came to be. By the way, that's Riley in the background, our rooster. He's been with us six or seven years. Grassroots, been around for about 40 years. This is our 40th year. Wow. Um, I did Peace Corps back in the middle 60s. I was one of the early Peace Corps volunteers and lived in the jungle for a couple years and came back and tried school teaching again and found out I couldn't be inside and I fell in love with growing things in horticulture and part of that uh, back to the earth in the 1960s and so I ended up uh, doing horticulture. Okay, how did you choose the name Grassroots? Actually it was political, you know, in the 1960s it was very easy to be political and anti-war, which I was, and Grassroots was part of, uh, of the politics of things. If you're with the Grassroots, you're with the people. And the basis of our business, really, it's all about people. Yeah, it's about horticulture, but it's also about uh, people, because the people come first. Tom, what makes Grassroots so unique? Well, first of all, it's having the courage to be unique. You know, because in an industry like so many things, you look at what the big box people do, and it seems to me so much of our industry likes the homogeneity, likes symmetry. And so what I've configured over the years, we try to be as asymmetrical as we can. It seems like you're very geared towards family and family activities. What kinds of things do you have that um, draw a family in and maybe get them to stay for a while? Well, first and foremost, reality is that Grassroots is a business. And in a rural area and in a place that, as you said in your intro, you've got to drive to get here. We're a destination. We used to have our businesses on main traffic roads, and now they've got to drive to be here. And so I've had to cultivate market niches. My first niche, you know, that I had was our generation. I'm 72 years old, so, you know, I marketed to the older people. And then I began to realize a big part of our world here are the millennials, the kids. And so we began to do a lot of family-centered things, activities for the kids, uh, heritage gardens, uh, food plots, encouraging families to grow their own food. And some of the theatrical things are we bring in cats every year, six or seven cats, and the, and the people play with them all summer and the kids play with them. Kids Nursery is evolving. 
Um, normally in a business, when you talk about a nursery in our business, you know, you come in, you want something for landscaping, we'll sell your fruit tree, a shade tree, but targeting marketing kids is different. You know, um, because I've been an, an environmental activist most of my life, the next generation has been important and it, it's hard in a commercial business to segue from, from just selling parents, you know, trees to getting the kids, you know, to appreciate. Well, I bring in like a potentilla, you know, so I'll have a $5 potentilla. You know, the parents will buy like a $30 to $40 potentilla, but the kids can buy a $5 potentilla, a $5 doggo crab. And so we encourage the parents to go home and set up heritage gardens. So it's actually a downpriced the whole kids nursery so it's price accessible. So a grandparent can come in, instead of buying them a bottle of pop, you know, they can buy them a little plant to come home. And I agree, I think it's a great concept and I hope other people pick up on it because the next generation has to pick up on planting things, not only planting good food, but planting fruit trees that will last 10, 20, you know, 30 years. So you plug in the heritage thing, you know, plug in nature, try to get away from, you know, commercial foods to the degree that we can in northern Minnesota. What are your summer seminars? What are some of the topics that you do? And who determines what the topics are? And what kind of a turnout do you have for Holy those? Holy God's a war woman. What a diversity of questions. And, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> it's easy to do seminars here because I've got a great staff. I've got Pam, who's got years as an artist and also as a horticulturalist. I've got Gretchen, who's years as an artist and also takes care of our perennials and herbs. So I've got expertise on this on the staff uh, Dana Barr who's grown our cantaloupe and watermelons for for also 40 years can talk on the vegetables also we do things like uh, Reverend Art Johnson just did a, a seminar on caregiving for men because more and more men are doing caregiving and it's a logical thing for me to do here because I've got a, I've got an older constituency and again um, We've got a social agenda here. It isn't, it isn't only, I'm not even, I'm not using the horticulture necessarily just as a leader to get people in, but, you know, because my niche here, you know, is, is, is people. And, and so people come in and the seminars help bring them in, but more than the seminar, our seminars, it's the one-to-one -one that we do. Yeah, seminars are part of what we do, but it's the one-to-one -one interaction. And everybody here knows how to ask a question. You're really known for your herbs too. How many herbs do you grow and how do you grow them? Uh, I cut my teeth how many years ago? 35, 40 years ago on hydroponics. And hydroponics, when I first got into the industry, forced me to deal with nutrition. This was in the day before miracle Grow, before they started talking about, you know, putting all the traces and the molybdenums and the borans and the zincs and the coppers and all that. And when we started working with Dr. Paul Reed at the University of Minnesota on different systems of hydroponics back in 1971, I think it was, a young man came over from England, Steve Garton, who worked with Alan Cooper, who was the inventor of nutrient film technique, which was one of the early hydroponic systems. And nutrient film technique is almost pure hydroponics because it has no medium. It's just a, it's a flow system. And so you've got to have your act together nutritionally. And so this Steve Garton, um, put together, he was a chemist and a horticulturist, put together a blend of 13 different chemicals that actually works. And the plants that you see are a result to this day is a result of balancing the nutrients. And I am not an experienced grower. I have no idea what I put into the plants. But after 40 years, I just viscerally, I can tell like all you other guys that are out there monitoring your nitrogen every day. I have no idea how much nitrogen I have or how much potassium I've got, but I just sort of know You have a what feel for the plants. Yeah. Well, yeah. it elevates maybe the status, but yeah, sort of, I guess. Okay. Well, you're in touch with the plants and with nature, and that brings me to my next question. Yes, Mary. What is environmental Marty? Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Grassroots has the largest dragonfly in the world. I'm actually in Ripley's, believe it or not. Uh, about 15 years ago, I went to Arnie Ruthmeyer, who is the shop teacher, ag teacher in Perm, Minnesota. And I said, I want a tourist attraction. So have you got a young kid that knows how to weld? And he says, yeah, here's Marty Sazma. He's got, comes from an old farm. 
And so I said, here's a picture of a dragonfly, Marty. You know, weld me a dragonfly. I expect him to do me a little dragonfly. And a year, week later, I get a bill from Perm Steel, Rick over there, for $1,000 worth of steel. So I go out there, and in his Quonset hut has this huge two-ton dragonfly that he made. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was really cool. So we run it in parades. It's a symbol for clean water in Otter Tail County. Otter Tail County is in such a unique place with our river system. The Mississippi probably will never be clean, but the Otter Tail River flows through so few possibilities of pollution. We have just clean septic systems and a few barnyards, and Otter Tail River can be the cleanest thing around. And so Marty is a symbol of clean water in Otter Tail County. And we encourage people to watch their lawn fertilizers because that is difficult on lakes, make sure they've got good septic systems. And we're hoping in 20 years that we can be one of the few rivers in the United States where you can, and lakes, that you can drink out of them and it'll be clean. So it's uh, environmental Marty is just our little community service thing to, to pass on information for clean water. Uh, what time of the year do you start your plants? Uh, this is, one of the cool things is, is I buy no plants in for grassroots. We germinate absolutely every, every plant in, in, our, in our office building. I've got several growth chambers. We start seeding in, uh, in January. Actually, at Christmas time, I seed my hydroponic tomatoes. And so everything comes from the seed flats, goes into the greenhouses. We fire them up about late February. And so all the plants that, uh, all the thousands of plants we grow are from our own seed stock. Well, and I noticed that you do a lot of beautiful succulent planters. Do you have a person on staff that does the wonderful job on the planters that I've seen here? Yes, and I know that you're going to be taking some, some footage, you know, of the succulents and the planters, and that would be Pam Hemquist. She just has a talent, you know, for taking the succulents and, succulents and putting them into. A lot of the containers we do are repurposed. We try not to use plastic here. We try to repurpose particularly the galvanized stuff. We're always on the search for unusual galvanized uh, old trucks. And so she'll take uh, an old truck, an old toy, a metal truck, and she'll plant succulents in it. So Pam just does unbelievable magic, you know. And every day when I go through and I water the greenhouses, because nobody else waters these puppies except me. I won't let anybody touch a hose. Um, I marvel at the stuff that she makes every day. Just beautiful. Where exactly is Grassroots located? Um, I know we're in western central Minnesota, but where, where are you located here? You know, for your broadcasting area, probably you guys know where Fargo is. So you just mm -hmm. come directly south on Highway 10, you know, from Fargo to Perm. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the lakes area. You know, the lakes in our area that most of your people are probably familiar with, Otter Tail Lake, Rush Lake. So we're on Rush Lake off of Highway 78, about 10 miles from Perm. Okay. How did you pick this location to build your business? Well, we got pregnant back in, what was it, 1981. And Debbie and I, uh, I had been together a couple of years and we were looking for a piece of property. And so Debbie found this piece of property, 40 acres, a thousand, get this you guys, a thousand feet of lakeshore, eat your hearts out. And it's the most beautiful lakeshore, and that's one of the reasons that we bought it, because it's all bog and swamp. It's not sandy beach. It's just, it's, it's paradise to have a thousand feet of lakeshore in this day and age. And this site where you're at right now, Mary, was my production site for years, because Grass Ritz was in Perm earlier, was in Otter Tail. I had retail operations, but this was a production site. And then as I got older, I decided I wanted to take this production site and turn all these old buildings repurpose them into what you see today. So the old buildings, you know, that you would see if you walk through grass roots are all the ones that we tried to salvage. It's over a hundred year old farm. It was pretty abused, but uh, we've managed to restore and reuse as much as we can. So then uh, for your hydroponic tomatoes that you were talking about, so what kind of container do you use to contain the tomatoes? It's a good question. Hydroponics, uh, the kind that I grow, it's just, it's a piece of plastic on an inclined plane and I run water through it so there is no container. The, plant, the tomato plant just gets plopped down in the plastic. It's a closed loop nutrient fed system. Uh, right now the tomato crop here at Grassroots has been in since I germinated them 
uh, on Christmas Day, and I planted them in the greenhouse in February. The tomato plants are around, what, 15, 20 feet long. We've been harvesting them continuously since about June 1. Would it be possible to see your hydroponic tomato operation? I'm a little bit shy about it because they're not at the peak, but yeah, I'll be glad to do that, Mary. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Mary, for coming into the hydroponic house here. This is the beginning of my horticultural life, and I probably, when I say it, I'm going to, if I had my wish, it's going to be like uh, the godfather. I want to die in my hydroponic amongst my tomatoes. Uh, the greenhouse here is a good example of repurposing. Everything is repurposing at grass roots, and this is old recycled tubing and re-rod. I had Uncle Red over in Hoffman. We made up a jig, and, and we put this greenhouse together about 20 years ago. And the crop you see right here, this crop is about is about ten about ten months old, and we've probably picked oh God's war I can't tell you how many hundreds of pounds of tomatoes, you know, out of this greenhouse. And I know Mary, you've had some interest, you know, in mm -hmm. some of the varieties that I grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because most of my marketing, excuse me, while we eat this, eat your hearts out, you guys, because you're never going to get a better tomato and fresher than this. Not bad, is it? Mm -hmm. It's a really good flavor. A lot of times hydroponics gets a bad rap. People say, oh, I don't want to buy hydroponics because it's bland. Mm -hmm. But this has a really nice sugar to acid ratio. And the varieties that I pick are several kinds. You know, because I've got an older market, I grow some yellow ones because they've got a lower acid level. Okay. And then I try to select some of the ones from, from Holland that have a real high Brix test, you know, a sugar to acid ratio. And so I try to pick varieties, you know, that hold that, hold that flavor. And on the other hand, we've got some that are bland. It's like I grow uh, parthenocarpic cucumbers in here, you know, the European burpus cucumber, the all-female mm -hmm. blossom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's real popular with my market. Again, because, you know, no male blossoms, so no seeds, no seeds, no jelly, no jelly, no acid. And that's why a lot of my market likes, you know, the European burpus cucumbers, which I also grow in here. How do you attach the tomatoes? It looks like the vines are just huge, and so you start them, and then you put them into the um, the water solution there. Right. And then it looks like the vines just really get going, and then you clip them to something. We maintain a single stem, you know. So right now, this tomato plant we've got about maybe they're about 15, 20 feet long. By the way, the longest I ever held because tomatoes are indeterminate. The longest I ever held a tomato plant was a year and a half, and it was 120 feet long. So we put it in the nutrient solution here, and we gradually harvested it, and it became a bare stem, and it creeped down the greenhouse and back in, and we always maintained about four to five feet of growth in tomatoes on it. Wow. Um, how long do you keep the tomatoes in this greenhouse? I have a short cycle right now. I keep it. For years and years, I was hoping we could make money off of growing hydroponic tomatoes, uh, and you just can't. You know, back in the 1980s when we worked out the technology and we were doing well, boom, energy crisis came along. And for all the greenhouses, we had several years of crisis because energy just exploded, and our energy costs you know, just prevented us from making any money on tomatoes. So I gradually, over the years, I've morphed into flowers because it was, uh, it was more of a money maker. So I grow these. You know, number one, as a novelty, because hydroponics is different. And number two, to have a fresh tomato in June 1 every year is an attraction for my market. How do you harvest these? Just uh, everybody coming in and picking? Do your customers pick them, or customers do you pick them? Customers pick them, yeah. Do you sell off-site, too? Not anymore. I'm so glad to be out of wholesale. Okay. No, everything that I grow here, um, I, I retail. Okay. So it's really a blessing, you know, to, reta to be a retailer. I really like retailing. I have a question. I need to replace a shrub under a low overhang. What do you recommend? Well, there's lots and lots of options out there. I really encourage people to seek a lot of diversity in the landscape. But uh, to pick a few of my favorites, one of them is this nine bark here. There's many different cultivars, but some of them are low growing cultivars of nine bark. Purple foliage on this one in particular, nice flowers, uh, good for wildlife. 
Uh, some of my other favorites, uh, Divrila lanicera or dwarf bush honeysuckle. Uh, it's a low growing, kind of a ground cover type plant, uh, very hardy, uh, great for wildlife, uh, nice fall color. Uh, some of the other plants that I really like, uh, hydrangeas, there's lots of different hydrangeas out there. We have a fabulous uh, hydrangea evaluation planting that uh, one of the uh, series is going to be uh, featuring. Um, many different cultivars of hydrangeas. Um, and then uh, don't just limit yourself to the woody plants necessarily either. Uh, think about a lot of diversity and ornamental grasses can function very nicely in a foundation planting as a shrub in the landscape. Uh, various heights, everything from the low growing uh, uh, little blue stem uh, all the way up to something that can get to be five, six feet tall, like big blue stem or Indian grass or switchgrass. So don't just limit yourself to the woody plant material. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. When we came into this area, you have such a beautiful place, and it's so much fun to look out and see all of the different buildings. Um, but when we came through this barn, I noticed that you have all sorts of produce there, not just the tomatoes. Where does all of that come from? It's all locally produced. You know, one of the things I really enjoy, you know, about grass roots, is producing food. You know, way back when, in the early part of our interview, we talked about the original catalyst for me being in horticulture was growing food year-round in Minnesota. And just because we can't grow it in the wintertime anymore, it doesn't mean we can't have fresh food. And so we've got probably about four growers. You know, they're all within two or three miles of here. Um, our melons, uh, Dana Barr has been with us for about 40 years. We bought land together. He grows over 20 tons of melons, 15 different varieties of melons. Uh, really nice clean grower. We don't claim to be organic, but we don't use uh, any any pesticides or chemicals to control any diseases. Luckily, we don't have a lot of diseases. So what we sell in, in this barn, of which right now we're on the rooftop of the barn, it's a hundred year old barn and we I tore it down to the post and beam and we rebuilt it for what you see right here. It's all out of repurposed material. So we have just a really nice full menu of everything from onions to you know to asparagus from uh, garlic scapes you know to of course all the watermelons and cantaloupe or musk melons whichever culture you come from there so good question Mary I really pride ourselves on food this is really interesting up here to me this area up, up top on the barn you know we had a hayloft at our barn but um, uh, to me, this looks like it'd be a wonderful place to just kick back and, and have a pop or a water and just relax. Is that what you intended this for? Yeah, yeah it's really fun. Yeah, we've got, we've got people come up here. They bring their families up on the rooftop here. They can overlook down over there. We've got the kids' area where the kids play with the kittens, and we've got boards and coloring books. And so the parents come up here, they grab a book particularly the summertime people. I think it's to be about one o'clock in the afternoon. Kids are out of the water, driving mom crazy. Actually, they come over here, they'll spend a couple of hours playing with the kittens and doing the various activities. And mom comes up here and reads a book, grabs a pop, a cup of coffee. One of the features up here, talk about repurposing, but we're standing on AstroTurf. Back in the day, I was trying to figure out, you know, how can I take a, the old Hyloff barn, make it waterproof, and make it aesthetically pleasing. So I went over to Wapaton. The membrane underneath here, the rubber membrane, is from Wapaton Canvas. They make uh, the belts for the sugar beet industry. And so they've got end rolls of these big sheets of rubber. So I got the rubber membrane up here is for nothing. And then St. John's University was turning over their AstroTurf about five or six years ago from their football field. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time. So you and I are standing on essentially the 50-yard line from St. John's football field. <laughs> so that's where the, the information came from, from the Johnny's AstroTurf or the Johnny's football turf. Okay. Actually, we've had some jocks you know, come by and say, yeah, I played football on the 50-yard line. So it's, it's, it's a really cool way of, uh, of getting people in here, but also repurposing, 
you know, particularly in our society, you know, repurposing is, is a good thing for all of us to do, whether it's in a recycling or just, you know, using, using, you know, rather than throwing away. Tom, you had talked about reaching out to younger audiences. How are you doing that? At first I thought trying to market to younger audiences is something that I couldn't do because millennials, they don't want to plant gardens. They don't want to do weeding. And so the stereotype was out there, let's disregard the millennials, let's disregard the younger people. We don't know how to reach them anyway. They really don't watch TV anymore. They don't read newspapers and how do we get a hold of them? And then, whoa, then there's social media. And Facebook has really been awesome for us. You know, not only do the older people watch Facebook because every grandma in the world has a phone, not necessarily because they want to be on Facebook, ladies and gentlemen, but they want to take pictures of their grandchildren and they want to see their grandchildren on Facebook. And so Facebook has just been wonderful for us. We're very good at doing video on uh, Grassroots Otter Tail if they want to look at it, or Tom Minor, where we've got two pages. And social media has been something that has helped us develop a relationship with the younger market. You know, we get to talk about apple trees, food trees, clean food. We get real preachy on social media. Um, Facebook allows us to be preachy. The other wonderful thing about social media is you get feedback. I mean, we're just a little business in the middle of nowhere, but our numbers are up in uh, 1,500, 2,000 a week. You know, and for a little business, you know, that's pretty good. And we try to be real sassy with our videos. And, uh, um, and thanks for asking the question, you know, because um, for a while we didn't figure out, we couldn't figure out how to get a hold of the millennials. And then uh, target marketing them was hard, and social media has really been wonderful. We upload a lot of stuff to YouTube. We've got a web page, so the, the world of the Internet allows us to connect YouTube with Facebook, you know, with, my, uh, with, with, with the web page. So being able to extend, you know, beyond Facebook to, the, to our web page and traditional advertising. It's real hard to advertise in this world because DOT doesn't make it a very easy Department of Transportation and the laws make it very difficult for small business to advertise these years. You know, because uh, they don't want our signs cluttering up. You know, most of my customers don't watch TV, they don't listen to radio, so how do I reach them? And social media has really made being a small business and a small entrepreneur a lot easier than you might think. Well, Tom, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful place. And um, it has been so much fun to see what you do and how you do it. Thanks, you guys, for watching this show. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org.